the Pacific nations are here in Glasgow uh, to demand emissions cuts that keeps the 1.5 degree target alive. That's, we've been doing that over the many, over the many COP. Uh, we know from the IPCC report that uh, if we exceed 1.5 degree of global warming, we'll risk rendering uh, low-lying island nations unhabitable. And of course, at the same time, it'll be, we'll unleash storms and erratic weather that devastate communities globally. Whether it's bushfires, whether it's floods, sea level rise, uh, or super storms, no nation, no economy, and no people will be spared. So uh, that uh, preventable future would represent the greatest human history. We have the resources to do better, uh, we have the innovative potential to do better, and we can do better if we summon the courage to stop appeasing the world's worst emitters, worst emitters, and start acting to save those most vulnerable. As I said, that is number one. Number two, number three, priority for Fiji. And uh, so far, all the will the world has been able to summon has, uh, has placed us on a path towards 1.8. 1.8 degrees of global warming, significantly higher than what is needed to secure the existence of uh, low-lying nations and prevent global catastrophe. That is a failure, pure and simple. Some people believe the window to 1.5 is closing very fast, too fast for us to achieve it. Uh, Bill Gates has said it, it's closed. Uh, that is the only truth if we abandon hope. In, in human potential. So, there you go. There are parts of the world right now that are only just catching up to what the climate crisis means for them. But Fiji, Pacific nations, small island states, they've known about the climate crisis for a very long time. What is your message to the rest of the world who are not having to mitigate yet? They're not having to adapt yet. What is your message? Thirteen cyclones have struck Fiji since we ratified the Paris Agreement in 2015. Uh, and adaptation is, of course, our overriding national priority. Uh, that is our number one right now. We have clearly laid plans, including a national adaptation policy and climate change act. I don't know if we have a copy of that act here with us, uh, along with the concrete and nature-based examples of action when it comes, uh, when it comes to adapting climate, climate impacts. We've learned from painful experience uh, that in the context of climate change, you either pay to adapt now or pay much more later to rebuild from the rubble of climate-driven devastation. We are building seawalls uh, and relocating entire communities. We're doing that now, every day. Uh, six have been moved so far. Uh, six communities and over 40 others are in queue, which we need to re um, relocate. We are cyclone uh, proofing schools, homes, and infrastructure networks. We are steadily creating an entire economic sector that is focused on resilience building. To meet the uh, high upfront costs of uh, building resilience, developed nations promised 100 billion US dollar in climate finance which they have to deliver. Now we have to wait until 2023. They have failed again in 2021. Uh, now they've asked that they be suck it up and wait until 2023. Why do you think the promises have not been fulfilled? Why have what? Why have the promises not been fulfilled? They have not been fulfilled because there's no political will to have it fulfilled. The top leaders are backing off from the promises they made in uh, in Paris. Okay? Thank you so much, Prime Minister. I appreciate you. Thank if you. there's one thing I can ask you to do, your headline, your headline to the world from Fiji, what would it be? It would be uh, race ambition and cut emission.